Well, hello there. Have you ever wondered why England starts with an E, France starts with an F, and Germany starts with a G? Me neither. Let's move on. <laughs> Just a little humor to start us off there. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is History 302, the online version at American River College. And I am your host and tour guide, Professor Christian Jardine. But you may call me Professor Christian Jardine. So, why have I called you, summoned you here today? Uh, to give you a, a welcome video, welcome, uh, and to give you some introductory uh, comments uh, and uh, uh, guidance before the class begins, as we're getting underway, depending on when you see this. Um, hopefully, this will help to uh, familiarize you, familiarize you uh, with some of the basics of and about the class. Uh, you know, before we fully get underway, before we, we truly take off uh, and the real deal begins. So I'm going to start with a little bit about myself, not because you care or are interested, but because uh, it helps us to know, I think, at least a little about each other uh, to make all of this work, particularly in an online format. Uh, so uh, here I go. I am from the lovely city of Stockton, California. Any jokes uh, you want, want to make, I've already heard, uh, but uh, feel, feel free. Uh, I was raised there, not born there. Uh, the only child of a high school teacher and a hairdresser. You know, comfortable, uh, cozy, uh, little middle-class neighborhood. My ethnic and cultural background is Italian Catholic on my father's side uh, and German Jewish Protestant on my mother's, though I was raised primarily in a secular household. Uh, I played competitive tennis uh, and piano through my childhood. The uh, former, uh, I've played uh, competitively ever since. Uh, and my greatest hobby, uh, other than those two things, is, as I'm sure you can probably, uh, uh, I won't be surprised anyway, uh, uh, that it's reading. Uh, so, uh, uh, professionally speaking, I hold two degrees, uh, a, a BA and an MA in history. Surprise, surprise from Sacramento State University. Uh, I've been teaching at the college level for 25 years. Whew. Uh, for all that time, I've worked for American River College, Sierra College, and Woodland Community College, uh, and I continue to work at all three. I'm like a cat uh, you, you feed you know, outside your door and it just keeps showing up again and again. They keep offering me classes, I keep showing up, and I have for 25 years. I teach a large variety of history courses. Uh, I've taught virtually everything that is offered at you know, community colleges, but the, the classes I teach primarily actually are six. Uh, the two survey courses in U.S. history, the two surveys in Western Civ, one of which you're in now, uh, and the two uh, surveys or halves of world history. My training uh, in education, uh, my master's degree uh, actually is in modern European history, so it's this class that you're taking that I'm most qualified to teach, at least technically speaking. Uh, so, okay, that's enough about me. Uh, now let's talk about you. What do you think of me? <laughs> that's an old joke from a movie that I stole, and I've recycled it again and again and again. Now, I need some new material. Actually, if you're willing, uh, and it's okay if you're not, uh, send me an email giving me a little blurb about yourself particularly goals in life and why you're taking this class, uh, and what you're in college for, uh, etc. If you don't want to, uh, that's fine, but it'll help me a little bit uh, uh, to get to know uh, uh, the class uh, uh, as a whole uh, and the people individually, since we don't meet in person. Uh, this course uh, will include, uh, again, just to give you a, a brief overview, PowerPoint lectures. That's my main method of uh, you know, getting information to you, knowledge to you. Uh, discussion and web-based assignments, uh, what I call mini-exams, uh, because they're mini-exams, I know, cleverly titled. There'll be seven of them. I drop the lowest one. Uh, more on all these things later, so I'm just giving, again, a brief look. We will have a one-hour meeting uh, uh, once a week 
uh, on Confer Zoom live. Don't freak out. Don't panic. I, I know I can't force you to do that since you didn't sign up for a, a, a synchronous course. You signed up for an asynchronous course. You realize that or not, that's what they call a class that doesn't meet live. So uh, what I've done here uh, is uh, I've made it optional uh, and you can watch the recorded version of it uh, optionally uh, if you can't make or don't want to make uh, one or more or all of the live versions. I don't know what times we're going to meet yet, uh, what day and time for one hour, nine in the morning on you know, Tuesday or whatever, but I'll you know, forward that information to you as soon as I figured it out. Uh, so again, I want to make it clear that you're not required uh, to show up to the meeting uh, live or watch the you know, recorded version of it. Uh, you can skip it entirely. But doing either one uh, will qualify you uh, for extra credit. Uh, just showing up, uh, being present, uh, either live or on the recorded version, and ConferZoom does keep a log of who's signed in, will be enough to get you the extra credit uh, each time. It's just a couple of points, but uh, after a number of weeks, it starts to add up. But uh, if you choose not to, uh, it is indeed optional. Uh, but the extra credit uh, might come in uh, handy uh, as well. In those meetings, uh, I'll usually, in a sense, help you study, like a study session uh, for an upcoming exam, helping you study a particular chapter or a particular unit, PowerPoint presentation, etc., cetera, uh, unit by unit, uh, you know, uh, you know de decade, century by century. When the entire class goes live on Canvas, or if it already has, depending on when you're looking at this, you're going to definitely want to familiarize yourself with Canvas. I don't mean you don't know how to use Canvas. Most of you already probably are masters at it, probably better than me. You're probably better than you ever wanted to be at it by now. Uh, which uh, I could understand if that's your feeling. Uh, but I mean the way I use Canvas uh, in the class. Each, every instructor uses it differently. Some uh, use more features, some use less. Uh, so uh, you want to uh, uh, figure out before we start how to navigate uh, Canvas, how the class is laid out on Canvas. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be struggling to find that stuff out uh, when you already have to start doing assignments, uh, and then it becomes, uh, uh, I think, too much work at once. So uh, that's part of the reason I'm sending this uh, video out to you now uh, and other materials uh, that will go up on Canvas, uh, particularly in modules. Uh, so uh, I have uh, on modules uh, an introductory uh, uh, module itself. They're both written and short recorded video pieces there uh, to assist you in uh, getting your bearings in the class uh, so you know what you're doing or what we're doing, uh, how to access everything, etc. For most students, it's imperative that you take the time, however boring it is, and it is most certainly boring, it's a nothing if not boring, uh, to read and watch all the introductory stuff. Uh, yes, that's the technical term, stuff. When everything does become available, uh, uh, did I say that already? Uh, go to modules, uh, go through the introductory module, sort of step by step all the way through. Uh, the syllabus module underneath that, uh, which is the syllabus, uh, you will need to read that if you want to do well in the class. And the web-based assignments module, more on that later on, but uh, you want to uh, know where that is uh, and sort of what's on it really from day one, um, from the get-go. And below that, there then are week-to-week -week modules, week one, week five, uh, all the way through, uh, that uh, sort of lay out everything in the class, assignments when they're due, reading assignments, exams, etc. cetera. So, uh, but among all of these things, uh, it, it's, I think, quite necessary to read the syllabus in full. Uh, this is a top priority uh, if, in fact, you have the desire to be successful in the class. Uh, and again, I know all this stuff is boring and it seems like overkill, maybe it is. There might be some of you that can get by in the class and get an A in the class without looking at any of this stuff. If you can, good for you. Uh, but I wouldn't take the chance if you're not certain of that. Uh, you know, Online classes, and again, most of you know this already, uh, can be extra tricky uh, if you're not fully organized and you don't know where to go and 
don't know where to look for things. Uh, this is why I put all, all these things out there for you. As far as the what we're studying in the class, uh, the material, uh, the subject matter, uh, and how we go about uh, studying it, the tools that historians uh, use, which we'll be using as well. Uh, let's just start by saying that this is a survey of Western civilization, more or less European history, from about the 16th and 17th centuries uh, to the present, though we won't get to the present for sure. This uh, course provides a narrative overview of some of the most significant political developments, political history, as it's often called, quite broadly, of the early modern and modern periods in Europe, uh, and how they relate to some of the larger social forces, social histories, social history, broadly construed, uh, of the eras in question. For instance, we'll look at uh, important political events like the French Revolution and the uni unification of Germany, but also spend plenty of time looking at the social concomitants and ramifications of such events, such events uh, like how people's everyday lives and patterns of thinkings were changing uh, uh, along with it, uh, and partly because of such phenomena. We will look also at the role of powerful or significant individuals uh, like, I don't know, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte in shaping the past, but also at how social groups uh, like women, slaves, farmers, Jews, uh, were affected by history and leadership decisions as well. We will explore the important role of underlying, underlying impersonal forces in history, something that historians very much stress these days, like the impact of changes in technology during and after the Industrial Revolution, just to take one example, or uh, the mass migrations uh, uh, that were uh, forced upon millions of people after the Second World War. So uh, larger uh, structural, impersonal, economic, uh, and other uh, uh, forces uh, in history. We must remember uh, that history is a, an empirically based discipline. Uh, so this means a solid grounding uh, in the facts, the who, what, when, where of history, uh, including names, dates, places. Yes, I get that question all the time. Do we have to know dates? Well, yeah, you kind of do. I don't stress it as much as I think many professors do, but there's just no doubt about it. Uh, whether I like it or not, you can't sort of study history effectively if you don't commit certain things to memory, uh, which is basically true of any subject, by the way. Uh, but all of this, the memorization of stuff, will be done with more attention given to a further level of complexity uh, in the subject, meaning that we will be uh, uh, asking questions about the past. Uh, historical inquiry is a phrase uh, often used. Uh, so, uh, I want to make sure I don't miss something here. I do have some notes. I usually don't work from notes, but I am, uh, so I don't leave anything out here. Uh, so we need a, a grounding in the facts, uh, but we uh, the, the further level of complexity means we're going to be asking questions, uh, the why and the how, interpreting history, uh, illustrating how history can be a useful tool in, understand, in understanding the present, drawing conclusions about historical phenomena, and trying to understand both continuity and change through the epochs we're studying. In other words, a strenuous effort will be made by me, hopefully by you, uh, uh, to uh, make a connection between the important specific details of history uh, and the critical thinking and analysis that allows us to put them into a larger perspective. We will try to see how the particular and the general must be woven together uh, and uh, to get a clear understanding of the past and inquiry into it. Aiding us in these endeavors will make consistent use of primary source documents, meaning materials written from the time period studied, the time period in question. So if we're studying ancient Rome, we won't be. Anything written down that survived in ancient Rome, whatever it was, scrap of paper or a famous book uh, is a primary source document. So uh, one of our textbooks uh, is uh, a selection uh, of excerpts from primary source documents uh, through the centuries. Uh, so uh, this uh, will help us uh, uh, considerably uh, in multiple ways. 
we will be relying uh, heavily uh, on uh, uh, an understanding of primary source documents and other uh, tools, uh, conceptual tools that historians use to understand the past. So uh, things like, just to give us uh, uh, some examples, uh, the uh, use and abuse of theory. Uh, uh, there, theory is quite useful, but it can be uh, misused and abused as well. Uh, the importance of context in history, context, 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 uh, and the difficulties of achieve, achieving, objecti uh, achieving objectivity, uh, etc. I haven't been drinking, I, I swear. Uh, and uh, other such tools, some of which we'll, uh, we'll go into further detail uh, with regard to uh, in an introductory lecture uh, about uh, the methodology uh, and tools that historians use to unlock the secrets and mysteries of the past. I also feel it necessary here uh, at the outset uh, of this course, as I do in all my courses, of laying out the basics of my teaching uh, philosophy. I see my job as teaching you history, not teaching you what to think about history, to assist you in improving your ability to think about serious and important subjects, not what to think about serious and important subjects. Therefore, I try to be as objective as I can, I'm not perfect, uh, none of us are, uh, and present the subject from various viewpoints, not just one or my own. Uh, due to this, I furthermore stay away from making moral judgments about the past, which isn't to say that it is not appropriate for you to do so, but that my job, as I see it anyway, is to give you many ways to look at things, see things, and let you use your reasoning and analytical skills to draw your own conclusions on such issues. I do not like the idea of alienating anyone in the class whatever their political views and values uh, and sort of way of uh, looking at uh, and thinking about the world. Uh, so I don't show favoritism to one political viewpoint or another. Uh, I, I try to stay away from this. All viewpoints within reason and within basic fairness and uh, etiquette are welcome in my class, but I refrain from expressing my own views for the most part. Again, I'm not perfect. I do from time to time play devil's advocate and ask one or more students constructively critical questions uh, designed to get them to at least entertain the possibility uh, that, heaven forbid, there might be different ways uh, to look at something other than the way uh, they already do. This will not necessarily reflect my own viewpoint. It may, it may not, depending on what we're talking about. That being said, again, I am human. Uh, do certainly have my own perspective, views, opinions on things, and every so often do interject my own way of seeing something. A further more specific word on Western civilization, the study of Western civilization, consistent with the philosophy that I've just laid out above, I've just revealed. I look at West, Western Civ, uh, West Civ, to make it uh, uh, very short, with both a glass half empty and a glass half full approach. Meaning, uh, there are all too many horrific misdeeds done by Europeans to other peoples and to certain groups within Europe itself, much of which I'm sure you already know. Uh, things like slavery, imperialism, the Holocaust, which of course are important and necessary uh, uh, to look at uh, thoroughly, uh, completely. Uh, however, uh, as is true of all civilizations uh, in the past, the good comes with the bad. Uh, so we will also look at laudable achievements in Western civilization. Uh, uh, just to give us an example, the musical brilliance of uh, Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, uh, the uh, rise of uh, liberal democracy in Europe, uh, and so on and so forth. Europeans committed uh, more than their share of evils, to be sure, both at home and abroad, uh, and we must scrutinize them openly, honestly, thoroughly within the limits uh, of a one-semester course, uh, but should not lose sight uh, of the more edifying features of European, of European history uh, as well. Uh, they require our attention, too, uh, to get the full uh, picture of the subject at hand. In this way, we immerse ourselves in the full complexity of European, uh, 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 the European past 
uh, as is necessary to truly understand it, uh, as is true, again, of trying to understand any other people uh, and uh, group of people in history. With this, <laughs> with this introduction complete, I look forward to meeting all of you, so to speak, and hope you will join me in what can and should be, I, I say should be, uh, a fascinating journey of discovery through several centuries of European history. Until then, I bid you adieu. Adieu.